Jim Duke Radio Network. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. And these things that we're summoning into the world now are not demons, they're not evil, but they're more like the Lovecraftian great old ones. And we are, as a people, opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Rational voice in a world of conspiracy. Information that goes beyond boundaries. This is the Jim Duke Perspective. Welcome to the broadcast. My special guest tonight will be Laura Maxwell. She is returning to give us her message about the aspects of Halloween and how they affect people's lives. My website is jimdukeperspective.com. And that's where you can uh, connect with me and find all my information. Laura Maxwell is a frequent guest on the show. She has been involved in New Age and Spiritism and has a website called OurSpiritualQuest.com that's dedicated to sharing her experiences as well as hearing from others and their journey from the craft to find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior taking it beyond the boundaries to share her experience and deliverance from the effects of Halloween. Laura, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Well, thank you, Jim, and it's a pleasure to be back on your show again. And uh, you have given us a lot of your background in other past pot uh, episodes, so folks can listen to those shows for the extended version. Uh, but basically, you've been involved in New Age and Spiritism. You've had an experience with the influence of demonic spirits, how they take over and their dangers. So you know a thing or two about the subject, and you're going to present to us an angle about Halloween. Yeah, um, I remember doing a couple of shows with you before about Halloween. Um, over the last two Halloweens, we, we covered, um, I suppose, a, a lot of stuff that folks might be more familiar with, the, the history of Halloween and so on. but. Um, this time I, I felt that, you know, it was time to dig a little deeper and um, actually to look at Halloween from the perspective of how the elite actually push it, how it helps to, the way that Halloween is presented today helps to actually further the elite um, plan, the, the New World Order, the, the Illuminati's plan, and that might sound rather bizarre, but I do have evidence for that, not just from my own past involvement in the New Age before I was a Christian, but just from um, research that I've done uh, that I would like to present today. And that's right up our uh, alley that we, you know, we, we uh, look at the elite, especially through the secret societies and the Illuminati as as deciphering their plan and finding out where they infiltrate not just uh, you know the nation and things like that but uh, actually affect our own lives and affect our souls and Halloween's certainly one of them I suppose I would like to um, start by saying I know a lot of folks might think well you know what's the harm in, in Halloween and as long as you don't take it seriously and it's just a bit of fun um you're not out there practicing the occult yourself. You know, what's the big deal? Um, I understand that way of thinking, but I think it's important to, to realise at this time of year, particularly so during October, especially on Halloween itself, there is a lot of very dark occultic things taking place. So you could say, in a sense, um, the atmosphere is... is pretty rich with demonic activity, if you want to be quite blunt about it. Um, I suppose, you know, folks like myself and others, people who are in deliverance ministries, especially those who minister to people from satanic ritual abuse backgrounds, tend to find they get inundated this particular time of year. 
certainly true for me, come about September through October, right through to November, it's the three busiest months of the entire year for me. Just because people, um, they Google and they find me, they find my blog and they contact me and ask for advice or help. Um, sometimes they're not even Christians yet, they're still involved in a, a satanic uh, cult. Oftentimes it's their own family and they're trying to escape and so on. So, you know, there, there's no um, coincidence about this. It, it, it really is true. It's, it's not just a load of um, stories people tell to be sensationalistic. It really is genuinely true. Um, so, and I suppose, Jim, folks might say, well, you know, from your own background, Laura, was it significant to you when you were a New Ager and a spiritualist? Was it something that, that, that you guys tried to promote in a sense? And the simple answer, Jim, is yes, it literally was. Um, you know, anybody that's maybe listened to X medium testimonies or X new age, not all of them, but a lot of them you will find that, that yes, it was very significant for them in the sense of promoting their particular spiritual belief and practices, for example, whether it was um, witchcraft or spiritualism. For us as a spiritualist, it was a time of year when I was much more able to invite friends along to spiritualist meetings, to encourage folks to come along, to talk to so-called ghosts. It was a time of year that, that ghost hunting and so on was far more popular um, and people were far more willing to try it out, all under the guise of a bit of Halloween fun, of course. But it certainly was something that, as spiritualists, we loved Halloween because we felt we could really use it to um, out outreach to people, really, and try and get more people involved in the New Age and in spiritualism. So it was definitely a, a great time of year to reach out to people to try and get more folks under under our wing, so to speak. Yeah, when you told me that the last time, um, I, you know, I, I I wasn't surprised, but you know, like we hear sometimes that um, some uh, some witches were offended that we kind of glamorize their holiday, but um, you know, from what you told us, it's a it's a just like it, it's an opportunity for Christians to use Christmas and such to evangelize. They're using Halloween to evangelize for their cause, and uh, mm -hmm. and I know I, I know people personally that have met uh, people at Halloween parties who were into shamanism and such, and um, you know allured people in through using that that uh, that that common uh, cultural device you might want to say in order to bring them into the occult. Sure. And, you know, even more so nowadays um, when there is a, a far more openness about all things occultic. And, you know, a couple of years ago I went to Edinburgh to the Halloween festival, and that's a Halloween festival. And it's full of um, folks from the occult, you know, whether it be practicing uh, neo-druids, shamans, witches, um, mediums, you name it, a whole load of folks who um, the majority of obviously think that they're doing good. You know, they think this the stuff they're doing spiritually is good. And um, Yes, you will get some Satanists that go along too. But, yeah, they totally use it as an opportunity because the ordinary person goes along there for a fun night out and all the way along the street are, you know, shamans, witches, mediums and so on with a table, with their books with their tarot cards or their crystals or, or whatever paraphernalia they're selling and they are doing their spiritual readings there, they are speaking to so-called ghosts or so-called spirit guides for the the individual so yeah, it, it draws in people it definitely does and you know especially you know when you consider that if you ask most of these folks about Halloween, they'll tend to say, for example, it's the time of year when the veil is thinner 
meaning it's a time of year when we can connect with spirits far more easily. Now, this is interesting, and, and you know, um, no doubt they'll all give various reasons for why they feel this is, but if you can, if you think about it, why should a particular time around October, November um, be easier to contact spirits? Um, all of the, the, the explanations that, that they can all provide, if you just hold that a minute and look at it, look at it from a Christian's perspective um, for a second, and I would say that it's the time of year when the so-called vein is thinner because it is the time of year worldwide when Satanists, and I'm talking, you know, the hardcore Satanists, I'm talking the ones who literally do worship Satan as the devil, literally do conduct um, sacrifices all month, culminating on Halloween, of course, and do rape and kill animals and, and children and people. They... Uh, obviously, they do that all year round, but October's worst and Halloween is the worst of all. So if you like, it's, it's I believe the atmosphere around that t- this time of year is particularly charged with demonic activity. Therefore, there are more demons that are opportunists. They're on the, the lookout. It's almost as if, and I do not like to use this terminology, a portal has been opened, but it's almost as if that has happened. And therefore mediums and and Wiccans and and anybody who uh, talks to so-called spirits find it easier simply because there is so much demonic satanic activity going on that it's much easier for demons to contact people um that's that that that's what i feel is the case and, and not just of course halloween uh jim but as you know at this time of, of, of year, there's there's Day of the Dead festivals. I think we covered this on a previous show. There's Day of the Dead type festivals all around the world, interestingly, no matter what continent, and they're all about the very same time of year. So, you know, the whether it be Halloween or Day of the Dead, and they literally will have seances as well and, and even raise the dead from uh, coffins and the grave and so on. That, on a global scale, you can see why um, a lot of people who contact spirits feel that it is the most successful time of the year to actually uh, contact spirits. Yeah, I don't um, agree necessarily with those that say there's uh, we can have like a, a, a consciousness, a, a, a what is it called, a collective consciousness. But I think that in this time, maybe that like you mentioned the portal it's it's not that a portal opens up at this time it's just that mm-hmm. it it was a time chosen uh uh by by many like a con- concerted uh uh time that all the energies do the same thing at the same time and it's just yes. a bit great yes. awareness which makes it a, a bigger conduit for spirits sure. and that that's probably why it seems there's a portal opening up which it's just yep, yep. it kind of is a collective consciousness and so to speak because the energy of it rises and you know you and i mm-hmm. both know in the occult that energy has a large portion of 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 how through frequencies and such how these entities can travel and and be used as a conduit into our world through the conscious in, invited conscious of those that are willing to participate and that's what makes yep. it, I think, uh, uh, very prominent all at once, you know, in this time. That's exactly what I mean, Jim. You described it better than me. That's exactly what I mean. You know, um, when we trace it back, going back thousands of years, this particular time of year is when um, all around the world different cultures were doing things like that. You go back to the, the times of Baal and so on, and, you know, some folks say, well, could it well be because this is a time of year on the Jewish calendar, of course, where um, they have certain festivals that are, are, are very much to do with repentance and so on. So could it be that this goes back so many years that it's actually um, the demonic, you know, coming against pe- people's wanting to feel repentant and, and, and so on? Obviously, we know that uh, Jesus Christ is the one who cleanses us thoroughly and that we do not need to have a, a, a yearly, you know, time for repentance, as it were, 
but if you look right back through the the Judeo Christian calendar, there, there's a lot to be said for that, and perhaps that is why this all goes on at this particular time of year as accumulation, if you like, over the the, the centuries. And as you say, demons will just use that as an opportunity. Yeah, that was an interesting point. You brought up that last year about that uh, how why October is such high and it's it, and it's a, a high holiday because it's significant with the Jewish faith and with the feasts coinciding with the feasts with uh, um, fall with uh, Jesus Christ. All those feasts that were pointing to uh, Jesus, like Sukkot and well, the you know feast of of the repentance and the trumpets and the tabernacle all at this mm-hmm. time, and that would be the choice of occultists if they want to mimic or counterfeit what we have according to the, the time that God chose for Israel to recognize him, it would be significant sure. that they raise up that same time in order to counter it. Sure, and, and you know, even the fact of some folks may argue, well, um, all across the world, uh, it's just to do with the autumn festival and the autumn harvest and so on, well, not really, because look at countries, look at continents that at this time of year, it's not their autumn. You know, they're not having the leaves falling from the trees and harvesting apples and so on. So mm. it's not simply just down to a harvest type uh, phenomena. And some folks might even say maybe it goes right back to the Garden of Eden, perhaps when Adam and Eve fell, it was around this time of year. And, and again, that's why there's a kind of a demonic counterfeit who knows and that's perhaps going a bit too far and and um, it's just a theory but yeah there's definitely something going on spiritually this time of year uh cumulatively that's no an doubt inter- about it. yeah that's an interesting concept if it goes back to adam and eve i never thought of that one <laughs> um so but but you know i feel that it it, it may it may seem a bit a bit too much for some people to be willing to believe that Halloween is is pushed by the elite and pushed as part of their agenda. But you know, remember when you do go back and look at the some of the ancient writings of occultists and so on. Part of their plan, um, if you look at eighteen thirties Theosophy, Madame Blavatsky, and so on, they're very open in their books about saying. Of course, the Theosophy website is still there today, but they've always been very open about saying that they do indeed have a plan under Lucifer, because remember, they think Lucifer is um, a good deity, and that his plan is indeed to infiltrate the whole world and to spread all things esoteric, all things occultic, and um, in any way, shape or form to really... Um, spread people's um, awareness that we all need to, in their eyes, you know, ascend spiritually, raise our vibrations. We all need to come together under under Lucifer, basically. All roads lead to God, doesn't matter what your religion is. You know, the more you can open yourself to mystical experiences, New Age and, and the occult, the more um, we can all evolve as a human race and prepare for this age of Aquarius, prepare for Lucifer to um, bring peace to the world and so on. It is an agenda that, you know, this is not a conspiracy theory. It is an agenda because they have said it is an agenda. Um, Again, going back to myself in the New Age and spiritualism, we were taught to try and get as many recruits as we can. Whatever we were doing, whether we were at school, college, the workplace, Try to get as many folks as you can involved in things like meditation, yoga, spirit communication, and so on, um, because then they would be tuning into the higher spirit and they would be helping to evolve the whole world. So it, it was a, it was an agenda. Yeah, you know what's you, interesting is yeah. I, I was on the uh, Lucis Trust website the mm-hmm. other day just to see what they're saying. And, you know, they deny that they were ever called Lucifer Press that people say because they have it wrong. It's not Lucifer Press. It's Lucifer Publishing Company. And they cor- mm-hmm. they corrected that. We're not Lucifer Press uh, or, or Lucifer uh, Trust. We were Lucifer Publishing Company. And they boldly admit that. So that's not, um, that's not just a fable that uh, there are some out there in the New Age that 
that promote that, that's their own claim. And and they have this oh, yeah. ra- rainbow bridge, which is the bridge between man and Lucifer. And uh, mm-hmm. that's what they want to promote. So, yeah, there's proof out there. Oh, there's proof, you know. And as I say, Madame Blavatsky, she was meant to be the mother of the New Age. She was a Luciferian medium. Um, a lot of the New Age websites will, if you dig deeper, say that they believe Lucifer um, really is, is the answer. <laughs> they might not talk about it all the time, but but the teaching is there. And, um, yeah, you know, they just feel that he did not fall and become Satan, that Christians have it wrong, the Bible is lies, uh, and that Lucifer is, is, the, is the light bearer. So, yep. You know, I'm going back to the, the, the elite Illuminati's use of Halloween. Um, as I say, I have some interesting articles here. I'm going to read a couple of extracts from just to emphasize my um, point and how this is a concerted effort. And it's not just just the fashion today or, you know, just people like dressing up in costumes more and more. Um, they're getting more and more scary the costumes and so on no it is actually part of the agenda so uh, let me read a little from this guy um, is called Richard Evans and he attended dozens of rituals of Alistair Crowley over several years and the these rituals were acted out by members of the Ordo Templi Orientis So this guy says, before TV, it wasn't as easy for witches to get inside our heads. The Illuminati recognised Halloween as the opportunity to do that. So right off the top, I thought that was (laughs) a great quote. Um, I mean, when did TV start? In the grand scale of things, it wasn't that long ago. And yet the, the, you know, the Illuminati have recognised Halloween as an opportunity to do that. So he says that the significance of Halloween today isn't whether it was a day of mass human sacrifice by the Druids, sacrifices to Moloch, Baal and so on, even though it is. Um, this guy argues that the, 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 the more significant reason for it today is that for the elite, they can literally use Halloween as a mass magical operation. Now, again, that may sound bizarre, but think about it. Think about how occult magic operations work. In the late 20th century customs of Halloween, um, he says they may as well have been composed and directed by Alistair Crowley. Um, He did write and form rituals in the form of dramatic plays, Actors literally took on characters of a god or goddess or demons that the occultists sought to invoke. So thinking about all this in the in the realm of acting, Jim, and the whole, um, well, we know that Hollywood do, of course, use actors and actresses, but think about it more in the terms of the magical side of um, acting and performing and role-playing. So... You know, this guy says it's very simple. By acting like the thing, you become the thing. Crowley combined masquerades with Kabbalist invocations of demonic personality traits. He embedded them into plays and into song lyrics. So, this guy says, it doesn't matter if participants, actors, you know, role-playing folks people who are joining in the fun. It doesn't matter if they are aware that they have um, become possessed or not. They only need to act out and hear the words. It's the power of rituals. It's the power of uh, magic um, operations, like the, the Freemasonry symbolic initiation acts, because a lot of that is symbolic. Um this is how behavioural engineering has been done through the movies, TV shows and music industry. And so this guy says that he attended dozens of these rituals of Alistair Crowley over the years. And normally these are the rituals, Jim. You know, that they are actually rituals, but 
at this time of the year they were presented as plays and tickets were sold to the public. So it was all just seen as a kind of a role-playing dramatic uh, performance when actually, like Freemasonry, going along and doing the initiations just seems like a bit of role-playing, but there is occult... Uh, there's, there's demons involved in that, even if you just think it's role-playing, a bit of symbolism. It's not. It's demonic, and it is opening the person to demons. And, of course, Alistair Crowley was a leader, went on to become a leader of the Ordo Templi Orientis. <laughs> that guy knew what he was doing. Wow, Laura, you just tied in like our past few podcasts all in in one, and you you gave us a different element to it. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. We we've been talking about this, and uh, but right. you, you brought that element that it's actually uh, taking over the entity and being possessed through the costumes and stuff. That's uh-huh. uh, that's an interesting twist, and even even what you said about the Freemasons, I, I never thought of it that way. Uh huh. Well. Yeah, it, it just struck me, you know, that that's one of the obvious ones that the the average person, when, when you tell them what goes on in a Freemasonry ceremony, it, it'll just be like, oh, that's just role playing, it's just symbolic, you know. But no, it's, <laughs> demons are uh, attracted to that. And, you know, in a sense, that the, the Halloween that we see today, the, the level of darkness that surrounds it all and, and what goes on, as we mentioned earlier, there's more occultic activity. People take it more as an opportunity to invite folks to a shamanic healing event or a seance or whatever. You know, go, go back to look in the 1950s or before the, the 60s. It was a lot less harmless. Okay, yeah, there's still... Um, occultic roots there and paganism there and I'll go on to share later about my own actual deliverance from it just the the the, the tame stuff if you like but looking at it from the 60s onwards Jim Halloween um has become more glamorized even more and that they've glamorized it and they've sustained that glamour through tv shows and movies like the Adams family the monsters all seems very uh you know tame doesn't it but interestingly um i saw an article very recently uh by the a spokesperson from the church of satan now i can't remember what website it's on but it just was released the other day and he even said i wish i had it here jim because i meant to print it out and i forgot excuse me but he even said i will put it on my blog tomorrow actually but he said that, um, yes, Halloween's an important time for the satanic church, but that they also um, appreciate it because it's the one time of year they can get the ordinary person involved in dressing up. And um, he said something like contacting your inner demons or the dark side of your nature. You're able to really revel in it and really indulge yourself in that dark side of the role playing and so on. And you could tell he was saying that knowing that, hey, something spiritual is happening to you when you actually do that. Um, and he said, but if you really want to know what the Church of Satan is about, it's just like the monsters of the Adams family. What he did right there, Jim, was downplay the whole thing, make it all sound like it's a bit of fun and anyone who says otherwise is being ridiculous it's just a bit of fun. It's just like the monsters. It's just like the Adams family. But if you take it right back to people like Alistair Crowley, Anton LaVey, what have they said about things like that? They have said that those types of shows prepare the public to be desensitized to it, prepare the public to see, yeah, witchcraft's not so bad. It's a bit of fun. You know, it's <laughs> there is an agenda. Um Behind this, and you know, Anton LaVey himself, 1966, thereabouts, it's not coincidental that his cult photographs were really disseminated through the media. Um, he made the Halloween image look like a lifestyle, you know, he just he dressed up like that in uh, devilish costumes, and yet he would say, No, 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 we don't do anything demonic. Um, but you know, it is, he said himself, Anton LaVey said, I'm glad Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. Obviously, he's been sarcastic there. And, um, 
However, you know, there's there's plenty of, and I've interviewed plenty of folks over the years, ex-Satanists, ex-witches, ex-mediums and so on, and they all say the same thing. It is a time of year that, that we use as an opportunity, and Carolyn Hamlet, ex-Illuminati member, she said the same. It's uh, it's an important time of the year. And um, there's another article that, that I felt to, to bring, Jim, because it, it might seem um, a little out of topic, but I actually see how it all links in. So um, I'd like to share this. And it's a guy who, I saw this on YouTube, he is an ex satanic high priest he's not a christian by the way he didn't get born again but he's an ex high high priest and he does um want to expose what's going on and he has actually talked about um the the elite pushing what they're pushing the the occult uh, agenda pushing the occult more making it more acceptable to the public world worldwide and so on. And he says this, and I found this really tying in, um, moral relativism is the satanic principle that the elite have been and are pushing, moral relativism. And I thought, you can definitely see that. And um, he feels that they've been pushing it, obviously, so that people, it's, oh yeah, you can do what you want, it doesn't really matter as long as your conscience is okay about it. Uh, and so on, that there is no objective right or wrong anymore. And we're seeing that more and more. And he emphasises that it's it's really psychopathic personalities at the top of all these institutions that are pushing moral relativism. Do If you like, do as thy wilt. Again, going back to Satanism, do as thy wilt. Um, therefore, there is no uh, moral, if you like, ruler anymore. Um, you make your own moral decisions. What happens when that happens in a society globally is m- moral breakdown. You know, it's uh, a no-brainer if everybody's going to be going by their own rules, so to speak. So we can see that reflected in Halloween as it is getting darker and darker. Decades ago, people would not have dressed in the costumes they dress in nowadays. Um, um <laughs> Some of them are just so grotesque and so demonic. But it's this moral relativism. Well, it doesn't matter if you feel that's okay for you, then just wear it. So you can see how how it ties in. And for the elite, Halloween being this mass magical operation, you know, so significant to them. And we see that when you consider all of that and when you consider also Lucifer rising, if you like, everything that's been going on in recent years regarding the the, the rise of Lucifer, the Baphomet statues being erected, the the, the arcs of Baal being erected, just um, a more openness about Luciferianism, about Satanism um, going on. I don't know if you you have it over there, Jim, but we're seeing a lot more here uh, through the media of singers and pop videos, rock videos, where there's a lot of um, clearly satanic symbolism, you know, people being filmed in baths full of blood, which is obviously very satanic. Satanists do that in their baptism rituals. Things that are right out of dark Satanism is, is being pushed in our faces now, and yet the general public doesn't seem to notice. Again, it's just this constant... Um, <sighs> They're celebrating Lucifer and the rise of Luciferianism. They're celebrating Satanism. And um, it just all, you can see why it all flows together in actual fact with Halloween. Yeah, Laura, we've been talking about this for the last uh, several times. And (laughs) yes, we have noticed it. We're exposing it ourselves. You're Mm -hmm. right along the lines of what we've been talking about. You're just confirming everything. Sure. And you know, with the... There's more articles now even in the, the, the popular press about things like, um, you know, blood taking, um, using infant's blood and putting it on your face uh, for women is, is a great cosmetic treatment for your face. It's very good for your face, putting blood on your face. Oh, or, wow. That one I haven't heard. Wow. Yeah. You know, so what we're going to have now, the, the Avon lady bringing blood around the doors instead of a 
jar of moisturizer, you know. Wow. And it's um, the the eating of or the drinking of blood. I saw an article in a, in a UK tabloid just recently that some scientist or whoever was saying that, that consuming human blood, especially children's blood, how it's such a such a healthy thing to do. And it's like, well, you know, we know it's not because there are other scientists who are quite open and say, no, you get diseases when you consume human blood or when you eat human flesh. But again, we're seeing this, this nod to cannibalism, this nod to blood sacrifices and the consuming of blood. When you look at the way Halloween has progressed, um, again, it's like people will be desensitised to it so that, for example, whether it's S&M uh, practices that obviously you have going on in satanic movements. Now, you've since that book, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, the everyday person's just like, oh, yeah, bondage, whatever. Years ago, they would have known, hey, that is satanic. But the, the lines are so blurred by now, it's... it's <laughs> ridiculous did you see that article uh in the associated press at least hit hit uh the states um in florida uh the police reported two girls planned to kill classmates and drink their blood they had planned on killing a girl and 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 somehow uh the uh, uh there was a police department found the the investigators uh found the girls out in a bathroom and waiting for a smaller student to enter and said their intention was to actually cut her and drink her blood. No, I'm not surprised. At, well, on the one hand, I am, but on the other hand, I'm not, because, it, as I said, it's a deliberate plan by, by the elite, deliberate plan of the agenda to push satanic practices to the public to such an extent that the everyday person can come across this, t- this type of thing and be convinced it's a good thing, uh, let's all go out and try it. So at the moment, we're just seeing these perhaps isolated cases of it being reported, but um, no doubt um, the elite want it to become a far more common thing. And if you like, in the way that that we are now in the UK uh, going to, for example, legalise cannabis, um, you can see why eventually things like that will become normal and not something that's, you know, that's a whole other argument, by the way, and I know there's pros and cons for that, and I'm not <laughs> really uh, demonising cannabis, um, actually, because there's plenty of people that benefit from it, MS sufferers and so on. It's just a point I'm making that you can see how things through time, through this moral relativism, um, just become normalised and, yeah. Um, hmm yeah, we have a uh, we have a report a couple of days ago. We just uh, or a week ago or so, we just reported uh, a mall retailer gift shop is selling shirts and it has a pentagram with a kid laying in the center and and uh, three kids outside the circle, and the title is "Let's Summon Demons, Let's Sacrifice Toby" T-shirts. Uh-huh. That's what they're I called. Saw that. Oh yep. my gosh. Yeah, and that's like that's like my point. I got off topic there about cannabis, sorry, but that's like that's my point. You know, that's a store, Spencer's, I think it's called, and it's been going for years, but mm-hmm. now it's much more successful. The t-shirts are horrendous. I, I did a little article about that on my blog, um, with a video to go along with it from. Can't remember now who produced the video. I think it was the guy that has a call for an uprising YouTube channel. He covered it, and yeah, that's exactly my point. Again, they're using humour, they're making it look like, hey, it's just a bit of fun, we don't really do this kind of stuff, it's just funny, and actually it's tongue-in-cheek. Really what we're doing is showing you all how ridiculous Christians are for implying that folks are all going around doing this stuff. Um, Using humour, I would say, in a way to desensitise us to it, and then, of course, when you've got scientists and whoever coming along saying, well, it's really healthy to um, put blood on your face and, and drink human blood and so on. Yeah, it's desensitizing us to all and, and it's opening the floodgates, uh, basically, for things to get worse and worse. And 
you know, and, and so folks will say, okay, but yeah, obviously that it is all worse now, but hey, what about the old times? Wasn't it? Wasn't it safe in the old times, Halloween, when you practised back in the 40s, 50s, when folks dressed up their kids in Halloween? Wasn't it more um, tame then? Well, I would argue actually no, um, because going back even then, okay, it was um, the, the, the more ancient traditions that, that they were really focusing on. But again, it's a, it was a time for divination, um, you know, what they were doing, dressing up and using the pumpkins and so on, is actually demonic. Now, folks might say, well, that is absolutely ridiculous. But it is when you look at the 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 customs of Halloween and what was being involved there, it's demonic. You know, folks will say, well, why, why does that, why would that affect you? And I can't pretend to know all the ins and outs of it, but I know what the Bible says. And I know what God advises his, us to do and not to do. Ephesians 5.11, do not imitate the deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Do not imitate them. Now, going back to what the occultists have said about role-playing, about acting, um, you know, what I said there earlier about um, the, the, the guys who, you know, uh, um, sorry, Freemasonry and a lot of it being symbolic, a lot of the symbolic things that they got up to um, might not, why would that be demonic? Well, it is, you know, and, and that guy who had been to a lot of those uh, Alistair Crowley rituals that were in the form of plays and actors and actresses were just doing what seemed like harmless plays, but there was severe role playing going on um, and Satanists who have said and have told us that severe role playing is Demonic, that article I mentioned to you that I saw the other day online, the Satanists for the Church of Satan literally said they are pleased that people this time of year are involved in this so-called role-playing, um, getting in touch with their inner demons or something like that. He called it getting in touch with their dark side. If Satanists are pleased about it, you know, if they're pleased about it, that tells you all. Um, so, yes, even the, the ancient things of Halloween is demonic and I would argue you're even partnering in a sense with the very spirits involved in Halloween and the occult. You're opening a door to those very spirits who are more rife, if you like, at this time of year. Now, again, folks may be like, well, prove it, Laura. Okay, I'll show you um, from a deliverance ministry point of view, if, if we want to go that way, I can show you from that point of view um, remember, bear in mind what the elite have said It's a mass magical operation uh, for the elite Not what the elite have said, what, what others have said, sorry It's a mass magical operation by the elite, Halloween It puts curses on people It's like actors and plays It's like Alistair Crowley rituals and plays It is cursing people It is putting demons on people So, for ten years, Jim Ten years um, in public ministry, in the media ministry, I have been sharing about Halloween for 10 years. But since I became a Christian 20 years ago, I've been sharing about it um, with other Christians, a lot of who actually don't really want to hear this <sighs> in actual fact, which is sad. But so in all of that time, Jim, I've been warning folks and I've been telling them about the, the demonic origins of even bobbing for apples and so on. Now, oh, two years ago, um, or was it last year? No, I think it was two years ago. Again, you know, Halloween was approaching and I knew it would be more TV, more, more um, radio interviews for me, more magazine articles again being requested from me and so on. So... As per usual, obviously, I was praying. And as I was praying, Jim, I actually got this thought, and I believe the thoughts came from the Holy Spirit. My thought was something along the lines of, there I am again sharing about Halloween when, hey, I have not even been, del been delivered from Halloween practices myself. Hmm. It was like a, it was like a, whoa, slap in the face. And I thought, what? Oh, my goodness. I started praying, and then it was as if 
The light shone on the subject, the veil was lifted, and I suddenly saw for what it is. Wow, I have had a lot of deliverance in my life as a Christian. I have never yet had any deliverance from anything I did along the, the, the lines of Halloween. Now, Jim, and I'm not even talking about, some people might say, well, yeah, you were a New Ager, you were a spiritualist, you were in the old cult. Of course you needed deliverance. No, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about way back as a child when I partook of the, the normal Halloween activities that folks do. I'm talking about that side of it. So I got on the phone to two friends of mine. The three of us were like, wow, yeah. So we got together, the three of us. The three of us have um, obviously um, cast out demons before from people for years now, as well as had demons cast out of us, obviously. The three of us got together. We prayed about it. We um, repented about each Halloween activity, if you like, that uh, we could think of that we felt we had to present to the Lord. Um, and the three of us prayed. And lo and behold, the three of us had spontaneous deliverance. Um, now, folks might say, oh, well, you just made that up. You just imagined it. Well, you know, you could argue that, but if you've been involved in the deliverance ministry for years, if you've been around it for years, you do tend to know and recognise when deliverance is, is taking place. You can tell certain things happen, um, and certainly if you're undergoing it yourself, you can tell certain things are happening, you can feel it. So the three of us had a deliverance from Halloween. Now, it might seem bizarre to folks, but when you think about it, if, if you've ever been for deliverance before, uh, listeners, you'll know what I mean. You, you've went along and you've presented the problem that you feel you need deliverance from. And oftentimes uh, the Christian deliverance minister will even see there's a few other things there that you need deliverance from too. That's very often the case. So why not need deliverance from Halloween? You know, it's <laughs> you don't need to have been an occultist just to need de deliverance from Halloween um, activities. That's what happened, and that was two years ago. For a minute, I keep thinking it's one year ago, but no, it was actually two. So how was things different? How can I, you know, what was the implications of that? What was the fruit of that? Well, quite frankly, I, I, it was as if I saw Halloween in an even more um, clearer way than I had before, even though I've been talking about it for 10, 20 years. I really saw how demonic it is, how satanic it is, because I was then cleansed, if you like, Jim, from those Halloween demons, if you like. I was cleansed from that so I could see it with even clearer eyes. I could see even sharper um, from from Christ's view what is, is going on there. And also I noticed that I had an even less tolerance towards it than I had before. And I had pretty much zero tolerance to it before. <laughs> Anyhow... <laughs> But after my deliverance from it, the, it's just as if, and I guess the more cleansing we have as a Christian, the closer to Jesus we become, the more of a life of holiness we lead, the more cleansing we have, then the more we um, are able to see the darkness and are able to, to you know, show folks uh, the truth and show fo folks the light and point people uh, closer and closer to Christ and that you know obviously that applies to everything not just Halloween it applies to our whole walk of life you know Jesus wants us to be walking in holiness in all areas of our life not just something like that so I would say yeah Halloween affects us even if you've been a Christian for 20 years uh, and you've not done Halloween stuff since you were a child there are very high possibility you still need uh, deliverance and cleansing from it as is the case with most things um, that require deliverance, of course. You, and, you know, and it, yeah. Do you think it's uh, because of some people more, like, uh, the more someone was affected, like, I know people that love Halloween, that's their favorite holiday, and they're just so entranced by it, that uh -huh. they might need a deliverance from it, uh, an actual statement procla procla uh, proclaiming, or proclamation is what I'm trying to say, statement from it. Uh, whereas other people may have just it been part of their culture and then they didn't give it a second mind when they came to Christ. They may not need the deliverance from it 
or do you suggest everybody should have a deliverance from it if they participated? Yeah, very, very good question, and I see your point. Um, And I think like any particular, if we want to call it sin, any particular sin, whatever it may be, um, say, you know, for example, it's uh, pornography or, or, you know, whatever the sin might be in a person's life, if if it's an addiction to a a drug or whatever it is, if it's a, a raging temper, whatever it is, if... It's something that has went down the generations and you saw your your parents or your grandparents, something that's in your family, and it's obvious that it's a, a demonic thing that you need deliverance from, then yes, I would say um, get deliverance for it. And that, that goes for any area of a person's life, no matter how long they've been a Christian. The Bible talks about curses um, and uh, that type of thing. So, but I think, yes... Same thing applies for Halloween. You know, I think that um, anyone who, as you say, really loves it, really, really into it and so on, then yes, I would say I do believe they will need deliverance from it. Does it mean that absolutely everyone who's been involved in Halloween needs deliverance? I would be um, hesitant to put out a a, a great... uh, you know, s- statement and blanket term on say, yes, you definitely do need deliverance if you have done Halloween. But I'm more apt to think it is very possible simply because, Jim, you know, when you've been around deliverance ministries for years, you can see how demons take an opportunity. The slightest bit of sin um, is an open door. They will take that opportunity um, to attach to people and yeah, it, it's it's that is perhaps a grand statement, and I could be uh, over exaggerating there. But but let me say this: I would, and I know there are deliverance ministries that can go overboard, and that is not healthy at all for people um, to be always running about looking for deliverance from this and from that. But if something is presenting itself, if you feel the Holy Spirit is showing you that you need deliverance for it, then certainly why not? Uh, you know, seek that. Um, I would rather err on that than err on uh, being a lukewarm Christian, being a Christian that's just, oh, anything goes, doesn't matter. You know, there are some Christians that feel and who teach today, doesn't matter if you do a bit of New Age or a bit of the old cult, you know, doesn't matter if you uh, do all these things because you're a Christian. A Christian, You're under the blood of Jesus. God forgives you anyway. And, you know, it's all cool. It's not all cool. Any of these kind of things that are pushed on Christians and folks are doing it, it's not a case of you're under the blood of Jesus, you'll be protected. That is not what the New Testament teaches. The Apostle Paul and the others were constantly uh, teaching the church to be aware of occult practices and so on, sexual practices, you know, whatever, sinful stuff. They were constantly warning them to keep away from it. Why? Because they knew it was damaging to them spiritually, and they knew Christ did not want them to partake of these things. That's interesting, um, because, you know, I, I brought up a point recently. Uh, the Lord kind of showed me something. You know how people are involved in Catholicism, and, uh, you know, there's people that are Catholics, and they haven't gone to church in, you know, any day during <laughs> during the year, but they call them they call them the C and Ears, the Christmas and Easters. Uh, they go on just the high holidays of Christianity, uh, of mm-hmm. uh, of Catholicism, I should say, and that makes them still sort of involved, and they still feel that they have a place, and their religion is Catholicism, and they only meet on those high holy days, and that makes mm-hmm. them uh, continue to be Catholic. Now, at the same time. If they're doing the same thing with Halloween once a year, participating in Halloween, and just becoming that on that one day of the high day, isn't that sort of the same thing? Almost they're participating, and and that could m- mean that they're they're celebrating that all year around. They consider themselves Catholics one day, so they must be considering themselves occultists and pagans one day. Which means that they're probably living their life that way anyway, and just ha- just coming together on the high holy day. They don't realize that they're actually doing that. And another thing, a point I wanted to make is that 
uh, while they think that they're just participating in fun and it's not really um, symbolizing the old uh, ancient uh, uh, rituals and such of what they're doing, they don't realize that in the background there are people doing these rituals for real simultaneously while they're doing it in in mimicking the same aspects. And what uh, I had realized is that the participation on the surface, you know, the trick-or-treat and going house to house and dressing up, doing the same things that the Druids and those behind the scenes are still practicing, they are actually being proxied by the ceremonies. So they're being used. They don't even realize they are participating. They just don't have to do the bonfire, the real bonfire, because they're just doing a simulated bonfire because there's a proxy doing it for them at the ceremony station in the yes. ritual sites. So they are yes. participating even though they don't realize it. So maybe this is a uh, cause for them to have to uh, denounce it and, and you know be delivered. Yes, um, absolutely. And, you know, uh, again, there was something just recently I was reading um, where Satanists have said, now it was either Anton LaVey or Alistair Crowley. I think it was Alistair Crowley. And I do have this information somewhere. Sorry, I just didn't think I would need it for this show. It's probably on my blog. But they had uh, literally said that when people do these things, they are acting, in a sense, like Satanists by proxy. Exactly that word you used there, Jim. So I'm mm. amazed you actually said, you actually said that word because that is something they have said. It is like Satanism by proxy, because you're not literally doing it, as it were, but you're still um, going through the motions of pretending to do it, of uh, being symbolic and so on. If if the hardcore evil Satanists literally like the fact that people are doing this at Halloween, then that shows you these guys know, these guys know their supernatural power. These guys tend to be very clever folks that um, have studied the, in, the occult in depth. They know the power of it, and they would not say something like that if it was not true. They would not say that role-playing role um, gets you demonised if it was not true. Um, so, yeah, and, and, you know, talking about, um, and, you know, and look, would, would Jesus, do you really think Jesus or the disciples, look at all the folks in the New Testament that the, the, the the believers, do you really can imagine Jesus and the disciples and all his followed followers getting dressed up and having Halloween or, or you know, going to Day of the Dead festivals? Is it really something that, that you think Jesus would do? No. He focused on life. He focused on healing people. Um, you know, Philippines 4, verse 8, whatever is lovely, whatever is, think about these things. Whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, you know, there isn't anything godly about what you see um, when you look at Halloween and everything that it uh, represents. And speaking about Catholicism there, I would agree whether a person is a Catholic or whether they consider themselves um, a, a Protestant type of believer, Um whether they are a, a nominal Christian, if you like, and Christian in name only, don't really believe in Jesus. There's a lot of folks, as we know, go to churches. They don't really believe in Jesus, but they go every Sunday and, and they go to all the, the all the events, as you say. But that person has not got a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, they are not saved. So, uh, you know, keeping up with my point is going through all the motions of going to rituals, um, is not what brings a person to salvation, is not what brings a person to Jesus Christ. And, of course, we know, um, I wouldn't dare say anything as dramatic like um, there are no Catholics who are born again and who love Jesus, because that's not true. I know that there are, but within the Catholic tradition, so much of it is not biblical, it's rituals. It's man-made, it's praying certain prayers, it's praying to Mary and the saints, it's using rosary beads, it's all these things that it is not going to Jesus alone. 
Um, it's using these idols and these idolatries and so on, or trusting in the priest or trusting in the pope. There's nothing like that in the in the in the Bible actually. We have to trust in Jesus alone, and it's through Him we have salvation. What I notice a sad thing is, you know, if you do talk to a, a lot of Catholic folks, and and they'll even have written it in their books or articles online and so on. So many of them don't even know if they have salvation. You know, they they feel that well, don't really know if I'm saved. I'm going to mass and I'm doing all that I'm supposed to do and you know, reading these prayer books and all that, but I don't really know if I'll go to heaven when I die. And in actual fact, I might go to purgatory and I hope that people will pray for me to get me out of purgatory, to get me to heaven. That isn't actually what the Bible says. Again, it's a doctrine of man and it's a, it's a terrible shame because folks aren't even knowing if they're saved. They're not putting their trust in Jesus alone. Um, oftentimes their trust is going in their priest instead. So... Yeah, you know, that's another reason. But again, it's similar to what we're talking about. Rituals, whatever the rituals are, whatever role-playing people do, is not um, how we come to Christ. We we come to Christ and follow him by following him and him alone. What does the New Testament teach? And I would argue that definitely Halloween is not something that uh, Jesus would be recommending anyone get involved with. Yeah, and I, I wrote a I, I wrote a, a a post a little while ago. Bible passages for Christians who attempt to defend and observe Halloween. Basically, there's a couple scriptures here that would definitely define the aspects around Halloween with the images and and things going on, and and they can't deny it. But one is Deuteronomy eighteen nine through thirteen. When you have come out of the land into or come into the land which the Lord God has given you, you shall not learn to do the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. Well, that's an obvious one. Mm -hmm. One that uses divination. Now we're getting closer. An observer Mm -hmm. of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Necromancing people don't realize is, is summoning the dead or uh, recognizing that. And that's what they do on Halloween. It mm-hmm. says, for all these things are an abomination to the Lord. And Isaiah eight nineteen, when they shall say to you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto lords or uh, unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not people seek unto their God or for the living t- to the dead. And again, that's the sowing. Halloween is the sowing, the, the the celebration of the dead, and that's how the imagery mm-hmm. came mm-hmm. about. So, you know, it's not as obvious as Christmas and Easter, which I also really don't promote myself. But uh, uh, it it it's not even like you can't even pretend or mask it as a Christian holiday. It's not nothing to do with Christianity. And then we have in, uh-huh. in the New Testament, Galatians five nineteen and twenty how the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, licentiousness, licentiousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, Mm -hmm. hatred, and all these other things. Uh, And it says, and these such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Witchcraft is a a work of the flesh. It's not spiritual, and 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 it's not something that Christians are to be dabbling in. First, Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. I mean, mm-hmm. right there with just those few ver- verses should be enough for Christians to recognize, wrapped around the imagery, the uh, uh, idea, the, um, the, the atmosphere around Halloween, that they're mm-hmm. not to be participating. Yeah, uh, no, I agree with you, Jim. You know, um, definitely, but when you look at, look at Halloween especially nowadays, what does it tend to glamorise the most? Well, sex and the occult and death. Now, when you look at the occult and particularly all different forms of, obviously, uh, certain for- certain forms of Satanism, but other um, occult forms, going back to the Old Testament times, of course, again, what did we see all the way through the Old Testament? People who... Yeah. Um, people who were getting into sexual orgies, sacrificing their own children even, 
you know, a lot of it was sexual uh, orgies, sexual sin, and sacrificing people, um, killing people, killing animals, sacrificing bestiality, sex with animals, and so on. All of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, their demons required blood sacrifices. You know, look at Halloween now. We, we have um, folks now, even on TV, making jokes about bestiality. That would have been unheard of in the 40s and 50s. It's all coming together. It's all looking like the same old pattern. History, in a sense, repeating itself. There is nothing new under the sun. The sins of, of man um, have always been that way and, and will be. And again, you know, emphasis the emphasis on sex and death and pain and suffering. And again, folks might say, well, Jim, you just read that passage. That's from the Old Testament. Famous Deuteronomy 18 that a lot of you guys quote all the time. Yeah, but doesn't mean it's no longer relevant because it's the Old Testament. If you want to argue that way, let's look at the New Testament. Um, Jesus didn't say, oh, yeah, now, but now, you know, that I have abolished the law. You can now go and have uh, sexual orgies and sacrifice your children, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, and... For example, as well, divination, as you said, and the necromancy and the so-called trying to contact the dead, these so-called ghosts and so on, divination, magic, witchcraft. Look at the New Testament. It doesn't suddenly condone that. You've got the book of Acts, the slave girl, um, who obviously um, the, the apostles recognised she had a spirit of divination. She was a, She was a psychic. She was a fortune teller. That was her job. And they knew she had a spirit of divination and they cast it out of her. It was a demon. Once it was cast out of her, she would not have been able to be psychic anymore. That psychic ability was gone. Um, other places in the book of Acts, as you know, um, they would go around and preach the gospel and people would come from all around and bring all their witchcraft items and they would burn them. You know, sounds like a, 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 a deliverance session taking place there. All oh, bring your old cult stuff, let's burn it. And let's repent and let's get these demons cast out. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's never um, a good thing to just say, well, now we're under the blood of Jesus. We can do what we want and just say to Jesus, oh, please forgive me and, until next time and repent again. No, you, 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 you deal with the darkness, you, you will attract demons into your life. Uh, uh, that is just, um, it's just the way it is. God, prote God gives us protection. Um, we follow him and we, we stay in obedience to him and we walk in holiness. If we become lukewarm Christians and dabble with, with sin, then um, really that's not what the Bible um, teaches at all that, that we should be doing. It's the last days. If anything, we should be becoming more like Jesus, less like the devil, more like Jesus, more walking in holiness, walking in purity and in power to be able to be effective at spiritual warfare that is increasing in the end times. Purity equals power. Um, it's a time not to be lukewarm anymore. It's a time to do something because the Bible tells you to do it, not do it because you feel like it or not ignore the Bible because you don't feel like it. We have to be obedient, uh, especially in these days. You said it all, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, I heard something I think it's maybe worth emphasizing this point. You know, a lot of times people, Christians can be, well, it's okay, I'm saved and nothing bad will ever happen to me and I won't ever, um, you know, have an accident or, or <coughs> be attacked or be raped or whatever, blah, blah, everything's hunky-dory, I'm just walking about in this complete bubble. No, that's not what the Bible is teaching. The devil is real, demons are real. Human beings can do bad stuff, and we need to be close to Jesus. I saw recently a testimony of an ex-Satanist. She posted her, her video testimony, and she said that um, she was brought up in it, by the way, Jim. It was no choice. You know, our grandparents were in it, our parents were in it. Poor wee thing was brought up in it. She saw all this stuff. She participated in all this stuff. Years and years and years of it, um, they particularly like to abduct Christians in Halloween, keep the Christians in their property, rape them, torture them, and then kill them on Halloween night. Now, she was brought up seeing this, and she said a very interesting thing. 
You know the reason why she eventually got saved? She actually eventually got saved and came to Jesus Christ and left the coven. And guess what the reason was, Jim? What's that? Well, for year after year, she saw and witnessed this. Sometimes they would take a Christian that was a, a kind of lukewarm Christian and they would suffer and experience the same torture that any person does if you torture them. Their body would react the same way. They would pass out and so on. They would die a horrible death and so on. But when they took a Christian who was really on fire for God, someone who was walking in holiness, walking in obedience day by day, uh, resisting sin, treating sin like the demonic thing that it is, walking in purity and holiness, that type of Christian, when they tried to torture them um, or kill them, often what happened was, one, they, they, they could not even get near the Christian and they would see a bright, bright light protecting the Christian so that the Christian could not even be hurt. Two, if they did manage to hurt them, somehow the, the Christian was not even able to experience the pain of, of the torture. It was as if they were almost out of, out of their body, if you like. They just could not even feel the pain. And three, oftentimes that Christian would die before they even came to uh, the point of torturing, torturing them. What they would see time and time again would be the Christian would look up and say something like, Oh, Jesus, you have come for me. Drop dead. So the Satanists could not even touch them, could not even torture them and kill them. What What is that all about? Some Christians are lukewarm. They're not as close to Jesus. They're wishy-washy with their the, uh, their obedience life. They're open to sin. They're open to stuff. And you might ask them and they might say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus and that, you know, I, I pray every day, etc., etc." But they're not as close to Jesus as they can be. And Jim, I'm pointing my, um, at myself when I'm saying this. I'm not just pointing at others. I'm pointing at myself because it's true for me too. We are not as close to Jesus as we could be, all of us. We need to get closer to Jesus. That girl, you know, that girl got saved because she saw the other people, they were born again Christians, by the way, that they had, but they were wishy-washy, lukewarm. When, she, when they took the on-fire Christians who were really close to Jesus, there was a bright light and they could not even touch them. That says it all, you know? You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, we see a lot of people believing that spirituality that their closeness with the Holy Spirit and the fruit is seen by the manifestations that happen. You know, these, mm -hmm. I, I call it hocus, hocus pocus, you know, forgive me for Christians that have gifts mm -hmm. of the Spirit. I'm not mocking gifts of the Spirit, uh -huh. but just as Paul made a mention sure. in Corinthians that you guys are abusing them and you're you're basically going on and sinning behind the scenes and all this stuff uh, b sure. and boasting about your gifts and we see these manifestations of christians saying oh look we got we got feathers falling from the air ducts and we got you know all this thing mm -hmm. you know manifesting the holy spirit but that's not the mark of the the yeah. presence of the holy spirit as you rightly said it was the righteousness the fruit mm -hmm. in the believer, because the work of the Holy Spirit is not manifestations, it's the uh -huh. fruit. Manifestations may follow, but the fruit, totally. yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, and those that are truly in the righteousness and obedience to Christ, it, you'll, you can tell when it's tested to the extreme, like those extreme mm -hmm. things that you mentioned, when they're tortured, that will really test whether they're relying on manifestations and signs and wonders, or whether mm -hmm. they're truly reflecting the the uh, righteousness of the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit with the fruit within them. Totally. I totally agree. You know, and being a... Um, if I had to label myself, I suppose I would call myself a Pentecostal. Um, being a, a Pentecostal and being around those types of churches for 20-odd years, I have saw that and I know, I understand that, yeah, you know... People, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing, speaking in tongues, doing miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, prophesying, all of that, yeah, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit. But what does the Bible say about it? These gifts are free gifts. You don't earn them. There's people who have been born again one day and can suddenly heal the sick. How could they even have read their Bible by now? How could they have got closer to Jesus by now? How could they have walked a road of holiness by now? 
No, it's a free gift. God gives the gifts freely. He doesn't require you to be holy, holy before he gives you the gift. It's a free gift. It's not a label of your holiness. It's not a label of your um, goodness or how Christ-like you are. It's not that at all. And there's so many Christians who will admit and say, yeah, you know, I've got the gift of healing or the gift of casting out demons or whatever it is, but there's been times in my life where I've actually been pretty backslidden or I've really been not hardly praying to the Lord at all. I was still able to go and use my gift and, you know, minister to people. But me, myself, I was a bit of a mess, spiritually speaking. <laughs> because the gift doesn't suddenly just disappear because you're not living Christ-like. The gift, and you know, as, as the scripture says, um, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So what does that mean? It means that when a person's got a gift like that, they've always got that gift, whether they're walking really close to Jesus and being really walking in holiness, or whether they're, you know, lukewarm and not even repenting for their sin day by day. It's right. not a label. It's not a label. The fruit of the Spirit is more how you can see um, the, the, the effect of, of someone's life and, and their walk. Yeah, the person can have all the gifts of the Spirit. They can be amazing at the gifts of the Spirit and be super duper powerful. But are they walking? Do they have patience? Do they have love? Do they have a short temper? Are they rude? Are they self-seeking? All of these things. Um, that is the is the more of, of how you if you want to uh, have a label to see how you're doing spiritually, as it were. I've known so many folks who say. I've really been pretty backslidden, and yet if someone asks me for prayer, I pray for them, they still get healed. And they'll say to me, why is that, Laura? I feel so far from Jesus. I don't even read my Bible. I don't pray. Why is it I still can heal the sick? And I'll say to them, because that's what the Bible says. The gifts are rep without repentance. It's a free gift. It is not dependent on how close you are to God, how how close you, you are to Jesus. And I think in a sense, when people don't teach that, and that is biblical, people don't teach that, they're not doing a service to Christians at all because Christians can be going around laying hands on the sick all the time, out in the streets doing it, seeing miraculous things happen, and yet their own spiritual life is not on fire as it could be. Uh, you know, what does the New Testament say? There are folks who, when they get to heaven, they will say to Jesus, Obviously, they think they're going to get into heaven, sorry, on Judgment Day, and they say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal the sick? What does Jesus say to them? Away from me, I did not know you. Now, I don't believe he's talking a bit there about people who just thought they were a Christian because they healed the sick in Jesus' name. I believe he was talking to people who were hmm. born again, were born again, were following him, um, we're born again believers, but he did not know them intimately because they were doing the do, they were out there healing the sick and so on, but they were ig ignoring Jesus as it were. He was like backstage in their life. And there are scriptures in the Bible that show without holiness no one will see God. I don't believe in the once saved, always saved doctrine because I believe the Bible does not teach that. I believe we can lose our salvation if if we treat Jesus like he doesn't exist anymore, you've practically divorced him, you know, in a sense. In a marriage, if you divorce your partner and never talk to them for years, you're not yoked with them anymore. You're still not united. How can it be the same with Christ um, if he's not first in our life? Yeah, and the, the point is that uh, the, the, the spirit, your spirituality is not based on the gifts and people believe that the maturity is based on the gifts and what you're saying is no, they're not based no, no. on the gifts and cause you're, you're, you're giving them. Um, so that that's the mistake that people make. I think is that, you know, they base their, their spirituality on the, the, the maturity and the growth on, on the active usage of the gifts. And then they have the gift schools that, you know, to teach you how to even get more spiritual, but spirituality is not based on the gift. The gift is what's given by the Holy spirit. No, exactly. And I mean, look at Judas. I mean, the, the, the disciples that, that look at the 12, um, when you look at them in their lives, especially in their early days, they had the gifts. They they got all excited when they went out the first time they cast out demons and um, came back and told Jesus they were so excited about it. And what did he say? Do not rejoice at that, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. 
Um, yes, the gifts are there to minister to people. And of course, people want people healed, set free from demons and so on. But um, the disciples, when you look at them, they were a right motley crew. They were healing the sick, they were casting out demons, and yet they were a right motley crew. They still had their personality flaws, their unchristlike behaviour and so on, because sanctification is a walk. It takes years um, developing your intimacy with Jesus, getting closer to him and walking in obedience. It can take years. Look at Peter. He denied uh, Jesus, as we know. Now, what was he doing before that? He was going around healing the sick and all of that. Look at Judas. He... He was one of, the, of them. He was going out there healing the sick and casting out demons. Was he a very spiritual guy? Well, obviously not, you know. He um, obviously had a darkness in his heart all that time that Jesus was well aware of. Jesus knew he would betray him. So no, the, the, the gifts is not a symbol of, of how uh, righteous a person is at all. Um, how does that relate to Halloween? Well, I just think that we have to be so careful. Follow the Bible, obey it. Um, be 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 obedient, obedient to to Jesus, even if you don't really like it or really want it. The, the human nature is a sinful nature. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you asked a lot of people in hell, why weren't they? Why didn't they? Uh, you know, want to become a Christian? They might say, "Well, actually, I did believe in Jesus, but I didn't want to become a Christian because I thought I don't want to lead a holy life. That sounds really boring." Well, I bet you if they get the chance again, they would lead that so-called boring, holy life because <laughs> there's two choices in this world. It's follow the devil or follow Jesus, and that's just as point blank as it is. It's a serious matter, um, and it's a matter that does need addressed, and I think Halloween is a good time of year to address it. Okay, is there anything else that you uh, might have missed or that's something that you wanted to... Explain. No, if if folks want to maybe look at some articles about some of the stuff I shared tonight, uh, my blog. If they go on my blog and type something like Satanism or Halloween in the search box, there's a ton of testimonies from ex Satanists, ex witches, and so on. Um, stuff about Halloween, etc. Um, if they want to have a little look over that. I would also like to say, bear in mind, folks, that when I'm sharing all this, I might sound like a real judgmental person, but please remember, I was an occultist. I was involved in stuff, and I myself have been a Christian for 20 years, and yet it was only two years ago that I got thoroughly cleansed from Halloween when I uh, received deliverance from it. So please don't think I'm pointing fingers at anyone. I'm not. I'm just sharing with you as I myself grow, uh, uh, grow and um, get closer to Jesus myself. And what's uh, what's where can they find you? OurSpiritualQuest dot com. And that's uh, they can have access to you uh, every place they need from that site. Well, that shows them the links to my YouTube channel um, and so on as well. Okay, Laura, thank you very much for uh, bringing your insight. It's always a delight to have you. I, I really appreciate it. It's always good talking to you too, Jim, and I really very much appreciate you having me on your show again. And uh, thank you so much to you and your listeners. And there you have it, Laura Maxwell. Wow, what an exciting show. She's brought a lot of insight to us. My website is jimdukeperspective.com, and I thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. God bless.